It's my pleasure to welcome you all here today. I'd like to start by thanking the Professional Development Committee, particularly co-chairs Mary Kay Lambino and Michelle Jacques. And I would also like to thank Judith Panero and Lucy Leiden at AAMC for their help in setting up this webinar. Um, and last but not least, certainly I would like to thank my fellow panelists, Corey Keller from SF MoMA, and Toby Camps from the Manil Collection in Houston. For more information about them and their um, careers and um, track records today, you can um, look at the AAMC website. Um, welcome to our live audience today, made up of mentors from the um, Professional Development Committee's mentor-mentee um, liaison groups. Uh, and the um, webinar will be taped and available for broader consumption next week on AAMC's website. This webinar is in response to a survey um, of, taken by mentors who said that they really wanted more information about uh, managing. So um, Corey and Toby have very kindly agreed to come and, and speak about managing. And as we thought about what might be useful, um, the committee began discussing the various roles of curators today and how we not only manage down, but manage up, across, out, and um, somehow at the end of the day still have to sort of manage ourselves and, and our own careers. So over the course of the next hour, we'll be looking at all those different um, types of uh, relationships that we negotiate over the course of any given day. Uh, and in thinking about the webinar and preparing for it, I was remembering how early in my career I would find myself in situations where I would think, I, I got a PhD for this. I'd be on my hands and knees with a measuring tape, thinking about placing stanchions in front of a painting. And I, and I thought that was very funny. Um, more and more lately, I'm in meetings all day, which I'm sure rings true for many of you. Um, as we step up the ladder in our careers, um, we are managing different types of people, different types of collections, so really broadening um, out of our initial scope of expertise and gaining um, wider and wider portfolios, um, which for me at the Gardner includes not only the historic collection and the exhibition program, but our archives, our conservation department, and registration, and until recently, digital. Um, and I've been thinking a lot lately, not about, I got a PhD for this, why did I need to do that? Um, but more thinking, wow, I have a PhD and I have no idea what these people in the room are talking about. I don't know what a multivariate landing page or a website is. Um, I've never thought about mobile first approaches um, to digital projects. So I find myself um, sort of stretched and pulled in many ways, sort of challenging, but also very um, exciting and rewarding. And I know that um, Toby and Corey will have um, many other similar sorts of anecdotes um, and um, tips and just in general thoughts. Um, I think speaking personally, um, biting off a webinar about managing when I don't feel that I'm an expert necessarily in management, but will probably be a life long learner um, means that um, you know we're putting ourselves out here um, and in some cases maybe speaking hypothetically um, about uh, experiences we've had in the past or um, hypothetically about current um, situations and we would encourage those of you in the audience to please submit questions as they come up um, submit them we'll be able to see them and I promise we'll reserve time at the end to address those. Um, and without um, any further ado, I'd, I'd like to jump in and begin really um, with the issue of managing down, thinking about how we can get the best out of our teams uh, and how um, we can really sort of follow um, best practices or wisdom of group in thinking about how we manage um, a broader portfolio. So I've already shared a little bit of mine and um, I'm wondering, um, Corey and Toby, if you would like to jump in with your thoughts. Toby, do you want to start? Uh, yeah. Um, I hadn't prepared for about, about managing down, but um, you know, you as a head of the department, I think you sort of try to set the direction and ideally you make this process clear and you try to get consensus um, in doing this. Um, you know, uh, as a curator, people often hear you 
in the process of thinking and forming an idea, and I'm a big believer in getting team on that journey together. And um, you know, it's kind of a collaborative thing, and, and um, that is my my general approach to managing that. I think for for me, one of the things I was most actually excited about when I became an actual curator was the opportunity to manage, in part because I felt like I had seen it done um, badly so many times, and I had a whole list of things I was not going to screw up when I was a manager. I think maybe I haven't replicated those mistakes, but I think I've made a lot of other ones, um, and I have a lot more sympathy for some of the managers who I encountered along the way. Um, so. I think for me that's been a, a learning process in, in a strange way is to be a little gentle with myself um, while at the same time really trying to think about how I can best support people who are where I once was and what I would have liked from a manager at that time. Um, so that's been, you know, you're looking back at past experiences and then also making your own mistakes. I have two kids at home and, and sometimes I feel like it's a similar process of screwing up even when you have the best intentions. And um, But I think the more you can talk to the people you manage and ask them the kind of support they need um, instead of assuming you understand what they need, that has been a great learning experience for me. What form do those questions take, Corey, when you ask people what they need? Well, I'll sometimes, I mean, I'll be very honest and say, you know, um, I'm thinking about it this way. Does that make sense to you? Or is there, can I provide this information to you in another way that makes more sense? Also, sometimes, you know, you, I myself tend to ascribe uh, intention or motive to actions. Mm -hmm. And it's about putting those aside and actually asking someone, like, well, why did you do it that way? What were you thinking? And often you get a really interesting answer and it wasn't, um, you know, that may make you look at the problem a totally different way. Or it's not always a problem, just a situation. Absolutely. Um, I think, too, in thinking about, um, you know, learning from example, and certainly we all have um, some examples. So we've been in situations where we thought, well, if I ever got to be a manager, I would certainly know what I didn't want to do. And then I did. So your, your words quite really um, ring very true. But in thinking too about really the difference between um, leadership and management, leadership is meant to really kind of rally the troops together, bring everyone towards a common cause. Um, you know, I've, I've heard a maxim that management is really about thinking about chess rather than thinking about checkers, how you know, your people don't all move in one direction um, on the game board and that everyone is going to have strengths and weaknesses. And one of the things I was always very cognizant of was um, style over substance and realizing that my style might be very different um, than former managers or you know, someone on my team today. Um, but to think about really what strengths and weaknesses each person brings to the team and rather than really honing in to try to get them to overcome weaknesses, um, think about having them play uh, to their strengths um, is something that, that I, I try to do and I always hope um, that you know, my um, boss or peers uh, in the, uh, or across the organization will, um, will do the same thing. Um, but I'm wondering how you work with your teams to really make sure that your goals um, for your department or for a particular project align. I wonder if you have any thoughts about that. Well, um, you know, this is when I, when I talk about managing out, I, I'm a big believer in the narrative or the story. And, uh, you know, I, I'm a curator, so I'm organizing an exhibition or a public program, and I try to make that story, the journey that I hope eventually the visitor to the museum will go on, I try to make that central and then build around that. Um, and I think there's room there for creativity, action points, a uh, whole kind of thing. So I keep, I keep falling back on that as the, as the foundation for, for um, alignment in all kinds of ways, you know, think about what the story you want to tell in the galleries is, in the 
PR, the campaign that you would do. So I guess that that's the basis that I start with. Yeah, I think I would follow on what Toby said and say, you know, as a curator, if you're working on an exhibition, this is a project you're deeply invested in. It's something you've been thinking about that you care very much about, but you have. To, I find I have to remember all the time that not everybody will understand why it's so interesting or why I find this so rewarding. And in the end, you know, it's my name that goes on the project. I get most of the credit for something, yeah. whereas it's an enormous team of people that support that effort. So trying to remember that I need to bring a whole group of people along with me, from the person who's doing the, you know, the most uninteresting grunt work to the person, and that people have tons of other things on their plate. And so trying to share my knowledge, my enthusiasm, my information, even when you feel so stressed out that you have not a minute, you don't feel like you have a minute to, sh to spare, that it's critical to take that time because that pays off hugely, um, you know, in the future. You, I mean, this is, this is classic kind of mission-oriented or inspirational leadership. You hope you're modeling that. And, you know, a sign of this for me is when people say, oh, cool, this piece is falling into place, the story's coming together this way, you know, and the more the team gets that thing going, the better. That's an indicator for me when, you know, you start feeling the, the energy there. That's not to say you don't um, follow up with with action points after a meeting. Um, we're big believers here in having an agenda for every meeting and with certain people that I supervise I then always follow up with a summary email. Um, I try to do that verbally but then actually send a follow-up uh, memo kind of email with expectations in it. Um, that's not for everybody but for, for some people too. So um, a combination of kind of the inspirational stuff but then the hard um, milestones, keeping track of those is also important in, in many cases. Absolutely. And I think we're um, coming into thinking about cross-functional or cross-departmental um, teams and so perhaps we can continue talking about managing down but also think a bit now about managing across, um, horizontally within our institutions. Corey, you've already mentioned um, that for an exhibition, you know, it is, it's, it's your name that really gets linked to it. so your intellectual property, and yet um, it truly takes a village to get anything done. Um, and I'm thinking too about um, for projects like that or as curators rise up the ranks and, and become the chief curator or are, are invited into senior management teams, um, that you really have to um, then not only um, be visionary uh, and sort of sell, um, Toby, as you were saying, a sort of um, a vision and make sure you're on track with mission, um, but suddenly you're in a room not with curators, but with the head of marketing, head of development, um, you know, head of digital, whatever it might be, uh, and you know, we we get promoted because we're, we're good at what we do. That's terrific. And suddenly, we're sitting in a room full of people who are good at what they do, and they're from very different fields, and they have very different vocabularies, and often very different ideas of what institutional success looks like. Um, and you know, I think we've all been. In situations where we, you know, we're sort of we're getting we're getting there's a you know a push and pull and that's healthy tension is extremely useful. But at the end of the day, when you think well, it's you know it's my um, name or reputation that will be skewered by a critic, um, and I you know uh, thinking about titles or you know how um, how um, exhibitions will be relayed. Um, Toby, you were talking about storytelling, so not only in, in the gallery, but um, you know through PR and sort of external pushes as well. Um, I'm wanting to kind of open up the discussion now to thinking about talking um, to those experts in the fields within our institution with whom we have to work, and um, thoughts you have about managing across. Well, 
I would say that as part of our recent expansion, we had to do a lot of working in different places. And one of the things that was very helpful to me was really taking the time to understand the pressures or um, priorities that the other team members faced. You know, you sort of go barreling in there about what what I think was important and, and actually taking the time to ask them, like, what's your number one priority? And and sometimes, you know, it might seem even silly to me, but um, it's important to them. And so I had to take that into account and figure out if I want to get something done a certain way, I have to be cognizant of what they're up against, whether it's workload or pressures from someplace else, and to think about how I can help them meet their goal while meeting mine at the same time. And, and it's a lot of it's a lot more, I think it's a lot more prep work and thinking than probably we usually put into to meetings, but that's, um, and I wouldn't say I've always been successful either, but at least that's sort of the approach I take. Yeah, I'm always reminded too of, of the importance of communication. For instance, I, I sit on the um, executive team here, which is six or seven members, and much of what happens there is confidential. Then I'm on senior staff, and then I'm co-head of the curatorial department, and making sure, and also art group, which includes art services, um, comparators, library, archives, um, you know, making sure that thing, information is communicated up and down the institution, something I have to always keep in mind. Um, and um, that that's, can be a trick many times because you're filtering things many different ways. You know, when you hear an executive team very different than what art group is doing and some people don't want to hear the soft inspirational narrative. They want an action plan. They want to be told precisely what steps to take and how to work on those different levels. The chess game uh, analogy again, I guess there is, is apt. and. Um, we, we have, shall we say, a proactive registration department at the moment, and I've had meetings with them where, uh, you know, we have now, we've also become um, slightly more bureaucratic, and, you know, if I miss a step on the workflow for bringing a work in for consideration for acquisition, you know, that is... You know, I, I'm a guy who made a move from small contemporary art museums to a big collecting museum, and we never had any Ming vases floating around at the you know contemporary museum. Our registrars have to deal with works of all different kinds of varieties, and so you know, really trying to attune myself to their wavelength and paying attention to the details that are what they use to drive their work forward has been uh, something I've been working hard on now. I've, I've switched into what I'm calling the precog mode. I try now to go and meet with our registrar and tell her what I'm thinking before I fully realize what it is so that there aren't um, uh, surprises there. It is, it's interesting how you have to learn how different people work. One of the things that we're experiencing here at SFMOMA is that two-thirds of the staff now, we've expanded our staff enormously, and two-thirds of the staff have never worked in the museum itself. So we are, we're, we're sort of a third, a third, a third, a third of us worked at the old Boda building, a third joined during the closure, and a third have joined since we reopened. And I, you know, realized in doing this how much in many of my interactions I was trading on um, not chits exactly, but sort of past good behavior. You know, I had good relationships, long-term mm -hmm. relationships with people, and so I knew if you know I screwed something up, I could count on my sort of bank of goodwill um, to get that. And then when you're encountering colleagues now who they don't know you, they don't know your record. They, I mean, they may know it in the abstract, but it's a very new relationship. That was interesting to me to see um, how those dynamics change and how you're sort of starting. Uh, from scratch with somebody um, and that need to build a relationship from the beginning. It, it makes things very challenging. Yeah. Um, architecture too. When I was talking about these contemporary museums, we all were in one kind of bullpen and working almost on top of each other. Here we, I have colleagues in buildings down the block and so everything has to happen over email where it would be hashed out in a hallway conversation okay. or turning around in your chair and talking to somebody. So. Um, 
I, like you, Corey, you know, I'm used to close relationships and everybody kind of, I felt like, knew me and my biorhythms and I knew theirs and we could work stuff out in real time. And this is much more of a, you know, here's the communication and I need a response and back and forth. And, and you know, getting good with email is, uh, is key. I'm never going to get good with email. <laughs> <laughs> or in program, in every director we interviewed, we asked them how they start their day, and they said they usually answered email from 6 to 8 a.m. Uh, every morning, and I, my, I think our, both our hearts sank a little bit at that prospect. Absolutely. Um, it's interesting to hear you, Corey, talking about you know, sort of expansion, and, and, and Toby, you too, um, in thinking about um, completely new, um, new sets of people to deal with. Um, but at the Gardner, we had, I came in afterwards, but there was a, a new extension added, and I'm always very aware that um, I came into a sort of mid-sized museum, but it had been a smaller museum, and there's that sort of lingering, well, you know, this is the way we've always done it, um, from some people, and then there's, there's a sort of huge turnover, so there is a sort of, there's a sort of divide really between, um, you know, people who can kind of cherish the memory of what the institution was and then people who come in and they're, you know, they, they see the future um, much more um, than they see the past. So trying to get everyone on, um, on the same page there can be, um, can be challenging. And I'm wondering, um, Corey, this is particularly a question for you, as, as you looked at the big um, new architectural push and sort of inter interpretation pushes in the galleries, um, did did your staff come together for workshops to you know, help everybody understand what mission and vision what they were and how new initiatives were going to align with those, or were there other ways that um, you know cohorts but really sort of cross functional and cross departmental came together and learned how to speak each other's language, or better yet, have a shared institutional language? Um, yes. <laughs> Yes and yes and no. Uh, I would say in our own department, we did a strategic plan um, mm -hmm. for our department, which was um, both excruciating and mm -hmm. extremely rewarding. I would put out there that if you're doing a strategic plan, hire a consultant. It is worth every penny to have somebody guiding the process while you are generating the content, because the process itself, it's not rocket science, but if you're trying to manage both the process and the content at the same yes. time, I think you're sunk. Um, and I think that was very helpful for us as a department uh, internally. I think we've had more trouble, um, you know, some of our goals really uh, involved interdepartmental initiatives. And then to say, let's say to a very overwhelmed web team who's just redesigned the entire website, like, we want more presence for the photography collection on the web and we want this, 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 and this, and they're just like, yeah, we're trying to just get to the website running, um, we don't want to hear about that. Yeah. Um, and so that was, I think, I think it will settle out, but um, I think a lot of our big picture ideas have gotten um, subsumed a little bit to the reality of running a huge new museum and not knowing what we didn't know um, were, would yeah. be the problems or challenges and sort of there's a little bit of, of that kind of um, emergency maintenance that's being done. I think we'll be able to return to some of those bigger goals. Uh, but it is interesting, we did do also a new brand platform um, as we were preparing for the, the um, uh, preparing for the expansion and one of the things that you were saying about this sort of shift in culture was that the I think we got a lot of new people in who saw this new brand platform and suddenly decided that this was a signal that everything we had done before you know was terrible and we should just throw yeah. it all out mm -hmm. and then some of us were like wait hey it wasn't actually that bad this is a sort of improvement on what we right. had before an expansion um, and it was there was a real culture issue I think it's been mostly smoothed over but there was a moment there where those of us who've been here a long time felt very much under attack from these people who somehow felt that this brand platform empowered them to throw everything out the window that we had worked so hard to create. I think we could have done more in, in all these areas. I think everybody could do more in all of those areas. Yeah. I think that, you know, the urgencies of building a building or opening the program or all those things, they always take 
priority over the kind of deep thinking and team building mm -hmm. that would support them, but it always feels like a luxury rather than a necessity. Absolutely. One of the things that I've, I've thought about a lot too is that um, even 20 years ago when I started out uh, wanting to be a curator, I had a, a vision that I would get to spend a lot of time in the library and I do a lot of research and I do a lot of thinking and I would just put my brilliant ideas out there and people would love it and you know back it up. With it. It, would, it would be based on really the quality of the artworks that I was dealing with. Um, and I find more and more that um, my day is really subsumed with learning to speak other people's languages um, and thinking about it. You know, as, as both of you have been saying, um, asking and finding out what does development need, what, what does marketing need, what does digital need in order to be successful so that we can really think about getting you know, what is important to us actually realized. Um, or, or um, supported um, institutionally. And I want to segue now into another type of managing that we all have to do. Um, we've talked about down and we've talked about across um, and I think we're starting to broach the, the subject of up as we think about cultures and shifts um, in institutions as they, they, they expand or they change focus. Um, and so thinking about, you know, the vital relationship of um, our executive leaders. I, um, I report to the director here at the garden. I'm assuming that, that two of you do as well and, and, and most of the people watching um, this webinar. And um, in thinking, you know, again, another old maxim, like your job is to make your boss look good, um, is, is a good one to sort of live by. But also, um, if we can, um, I'd like to sort of talk a bit about, you know, when do you um, push back, for, for lack of a better word, or, or when do you um, help, uh, how do you help um, your uh, director or leader um, achieve institutional goals when, you know, they might have a different um, vision of what, what, a, what the goals should be. Or how, be, or put another way, as curators, how do we make sure um, our voices um, and, and what we hold to be very important actually gets um, the time and the support that it needs institutionally? It's a broad question. But. Well, I, I always think of, um, I think his name is Dr. Richard Polson. He's a, a, a biologist and an expert in primate behavior. And he says, you know, it's right in university politics by uh, aping apes, uh, in particular baboons, and so um, you know he forms alliances and makes supplicating gestures when appropriate. And uh, it's it's a joke, but we have a new director here um, who's been on the job two months, and you know it's a getting to know you phase. Um, I appreciate you know being a director of an institution this size is a big big job. And I probably cannot even imagine all of the demands on our new director, even though I'm on the executive board. You know, you know, I know about her portfolio of responsibilities there. So right now, you know, I'm learning, and I couldn't tell you when or how uh, the best way to push back. I can tell you with the previous director, I had that down. In fact, pushback was expected, and um, you know, you had to speak from your position, not as a personality, and say this is what is important for the project. Speak very firmly as your role, not your person, mm -hmm. in the institution, and that seemed to work, uh, surprisingly so. And you know, it was almost expected. I, I'll have to I'll have to do another one of these in a year, so I can tell you how uh, to do it here. Yeah, I'm in a slightly different position because I don't report directly to the director. Um, I report to a senior curator who reports to a deputy director who reports to the director. Um, and so I have a, I would say, we. this is sort of a new bureaucratic structure we have in place and I would say that's been very challenging. So for me, it's actually about making sure my message is clear enough so that it gets interpreted through multiple levels and ends up at the end of this game of telephone the way I wanted it to, um, you know, when I'm not there to represent myself. Uh, and so a huge part of that is trying to learn um, managing up to my immediate person, figuring out what what's the way that 
he, she is going to hear my message most clearly. Um, my the previous senior curator here, she won't mind me saying this. We worked together for she just retired, and we worked together for a very long time. But she and I are like Felix and Oscar, you know, the odd couple in the way we approach things. We work together really well. But um, one of us is left brain and one of us is right brained. Um, and it was really actually quite funny because I realized that the way information made sense to me was totally not the way it made sense to her. And that if I presented it in a way that was logical to me, it would just go right past her. It just wouldn't interest her in any way. And so I really had to spend a lot of time tailoring how I presented things to her in the language that she spoke. Um, and it took me a couple of years to figure that out, but I did eventually. But it's now something that I talk to my direct reports about because no one ever really explained to me that you had to manage up as well as down. Mm -hmm. And so that's something I talk to them directly. I'm like, you know, this is how I like to receive information. This is how it makes sense to me. Um, and, and that, I think, has improved uh, relationships. Absolutely. I was, um, so Toby, I am where you will be in a year if you do your webinar, um, another webinar like this. We are at the Gardner, I think about 10 months now into new um, executive leadership. We um, welcomed and onboarded a new director in January. Um, and I felt very fortunate to have a, um, an extremely supportive and forward-thinking board who hired um, Corey, you were talking about the facilitator or um, a consultant to help home um, strategic initiative um, document. We, uh, our board hired a consultant actually to a coach to come in and, and work with the senior management team to think about how we wanted to sort of set up our initial conversations, how we wanted to sort of set the tone um, with the new director. And you know, one of a couple of things that have really that really stuck with me. Um, were, you know, she encouraged us to think about what was important to us and to think about why um, it was important to the institution and how it fit in with strategies and to really go and prepare to say, Toby, this resonates with what you were saying, it's not so much about you but about what's right for the project or what's right for the institution, to be able to um, really make that case very clearly and say without reserve, I hope this program will continue to be supported um, because it meets X, Y, and Z goals, and then let you know, kind of sit back and 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 let go. Um, and if it if it was supported and you could continue to to work that way, then fantastic. If not, um, you know, digging in your heels and continually telling the person why they were wrong wasn't going to be um, a very <laughs> probably helpful way um, way to go about it. And she also said, you know, that we as um, the senior management team should really be very open about sharing information with each other and to to really understand that our roles were to support each other because there were, there were going to be things that um, you know, we all felt great about and then there were going to be initiatives or things that we felt strongly about that were going to change or were going to be eliminated um, and that you know rather than um, be an obstacle we should um, make it clear to the new leadership that we were willing to think about um, making changes when they uh, were beneficial to the institutions. So that was um, really help. It's something I thought a lot about in the last um, in the last year. So, in the interest of time, though, I'd like to um, switch tracks a bit and think about managing out. Um, Toby, you've already talked about this a little bit. Um, and so for those of us who deal in historic material, out um, often means consulting curators for an exhibition or catalog authors. Um, for those of you who deal with more contemporary work, you know, you're dealing with living artists. So um, I'm wondering about your thoughts on um, managing people over whom you have no direct authority, but you actually depend on um, a great deal for the success of, of projects. Uh, well, back to the narrative idea, um, and I think that this, I was thinking about this, I think this could work for um, an, uh, an artist you're working with or a catalog essayist. I think that, um, you know, it is key to managing expectations and um, inspire people, and it would build this groundwork that you could fall back on when the inevitable glitch happens, when in my case, a wall 
uh, or a work owned by you know, or the major, major donors to the museum has got to be removed from the show according to the artist's <laughs> wishes for the show. And um, if you have this story to go on, if you are in that situation, you can explain to the person who's got to tear down or build the new wall or the uh, lender who's going to re receive the news that we don't have room for their work and it no longer makes sense. I mean, these are worst case scenarios, but um, they happen over and over again when you're working with artists. And I, I have a mantra um, that I use with artists, which I just say kind of when, when I need to, I say, you're the artist. This is, you know, why we're here. Um, you hope that you've built a convincing rationale for your, pro your program. Um, contracts, rather than letters of understanding or MOUs, uh, something like that, are becoming key to managing expectations, um, as are installation schedules and a kind of dark day or production schedules on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I, with contracts, you know, um, I try to bring up fees, uh, studio expense offsets, uh, honoraria right away, uh, even if to say that we can't afford to pay much in those areas because I think it's a sign of respect and it is something that's coming up more and more now where artists want this. So I try to bring that up um, right away and then try to document that in a, in a contract. Uh, I'm a big believer in in-person meetings. You know, you hope you would do the studio visit or visit the scholar, um, have a meeting. I think having a meeting with the catalog designer and editor, if possible, is crucial because late at night when you're sending some picky corrections in, at least they know that you're the guy that you had lunch with and has, you know, this higher purpose in mind rather than just sort of an annoying person who's standing in the way of finishing a project on time. Uh, so that sort of belief, uh, arrange a lunch with the crew chief or your publisher, whoever's going to be your colleague who's most um, involved with the project so that they have a basis to, to go on. Um, and, you know, the perennial question of whether you tell the person you're working with, the, the bottom line, the actual budget you're working with, whether you build in your own kind of contingency in that budget or you try to remain uh, opaque there. And that's a, something you have to have a fingertip feeling for what they're gonna, you're going to do. And, the, and you know, the, there's sometimes it could be, you know, sometimes you feel like you're in an ATM where people are just kind of pushing your buttons mm -hmm. to get um, money for their project. That's something that happens maybe mostly with with artists and and then finally um, a kind of ritual and celebration component. I um, uh, just heard about a big exhibition involving many many artists from all over a region and there was no group dinner, there wasn't a kind of will the artist please stand up kind of moment and at the end of the day you know they're all kind of that's why we're, we're all in this is to meet people and be encountered in new ideas and, and expand our, our lives. And so, you know, at the end of the day, don't forget about even the simple introductions. We, we try to have a pizza party for any visiting artist who's there with our local artists or art historians. We've got a couple restaurants that have big picnic benches where we can afford to, or you can budget for a dinner like this. And these are the things that continue to resonate. And I just was reminded of this at a big opening where I was, I was involved with the project and I found out after the fact there were all kinds of lenders there that I had email correspondences with but never met and I, I just, I was a little sad that I didn't, that nobody thought to connect that it was another institution and uh, just another reminder of, um, you know, what, what we're doing there. So those are my, my thoughts about managing out and I hope they're something applicable for whether it's an artist or a outside curator or a lecturer or an, uh, an architect involved in the expansion. 
I think some of those like little nice touches you described, Toby, you know, which seem like, I mean, you, when I'm thinking here, you're thinking, oh my God, who has time to, to plan this and do all these things? It's crazy. But you know how much impact they have. And I've actually found that those kinds of things are, um, you can delegate those to a junior person who is thrilled to have this opportunity to make contact with artists and maybe they wouldn't have a chance to talk to or whatever, you know, the kinds of tasks that you add up on your to-do list that end up being these things you just dread um, are often opportunities to cultivate a junior person um, to give them an opportunity to do something new and so it's a good reminder I think to think like just because you don't have time to do it doesn't mean somebody else couldn't and it would be great it's a win-win for everyone um, but I think also Toby what you were saying about putting things in writing first you know like I know I'm personally quite conflict avoidant um, I don't I really just don't enjoy that and so I you know I sort of make a list of the things when I'm starting a project that keep me up at night that I think might go wrong and I start off with those like so I mean I've worked with a number I don't work a lot with living artists and I've been very lucky that the ones I have have been extraordinarily easy um, but I've worked with some estates um, that are tricky and so I just start off and say like listen I really want to do this I'm worried about this 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 how can we talk about this right up front and that has helped a lot it doesn't mean there are no problems but um, at least I know we've started a conversation um, at the beginning Absolutely. I think um, in addition to the relationship building, which is and face to face time um, and the niceties, which is so critically important for managing out, um, going back to something we were talking about before, managing horizontally, I think too, putting in face time with peers across the institution and building the relationships before you get to um, an impasse or you know, a point at which you don't agree. Um, is is really is really critical. But coming back to the to managing out, um, like you, Corey, I'm really conflict diverse, and um, so I would rather have everything sort of spelled out and ironed out at the beginning. Um, and I learned the hard way um, recently with an, an an exhibition that we have on at the Gardner currently, where we were lucky to partner with two institutions um, here in the Boston area. But it is a um, um, a project that I inherited when I came in. It sort of genesis was two curators ago and another director ago um, and another development director and another marketing director ago. So um, there were no um, sort of hard and fast uh, memos of understanding or you know, sort of contractual agreements or lots of verbal agreements. Um, some things that were buried in voluminous email chains. Um, and I think the, the group of people who originally dreamed up um, the parameters of the project with all best intentions, um, you know, kind of assured the other two institutions that we were going to play roles so that we had resources that in the end, um, you know, we, we, we didn't necessarily or we, you know, we um, felt that, um, you know, there were um, resources that we needed to, to shift to other um, you know, initiatives here at the museum. And so I, I had the very unfortunate role of kind of being, you know, Dr. No. I was always a bad guy coming back and saying, well, no, you know, we, we can't do all the heavy lifting for development and marketing and so on and so forth because we were you know, sort of a bigger institution. So there were a lot of assumptions that were never um, discussed up front, and I wasn't part of those. Discussions, and um, so I found, you know, not only um, for me and for the institution, but I, I, you know, I think for partners, everybody needs to be sort of protected by knowing from the very, very outset um, what roles and responsibilities uh, each partner will have. I, th I think it's always difficult when you get a bunch of art historians trying to manage complex pro projects, you know. We, we, like you were saying earlier, you know, we, we got promoted to a certain place based on our mostly scholarly abilities and then, you know, you're put in and I think that these these opportunities for misunderstanding seem even more rampant in these kinds of conditions when you don't have people who are necessarily trained as managers managing very complex situations. But um, you have to do the best you can do, I guess. You do. And I'm, I'm struck, um, you know, sort of listening to our conversation that, you know, we have advanced degrees and um, but really we spend a great deal of our time as translators 
psychologists and counselors really helping um, you know to support to support others, which uh, personally find very um, sometimes very challenging, and then other times very 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 rewarding. Um, before, you know, we're we're coming um, into sort of the last quarter of the hour for the webinar, and I want to make sure that we reserve time um, to think about you know, again, another important constituent who we need to manage, um, and that is ourselves. Um, making sure at the end of the day, uh, supporting, um, you know, our team and our leaders and our institutional goals, that we still somehow have time for our own research, creative outlets, um, thinking time. Um, and I'm wondering, What's your thoughts the two of you had, or, or what you have found effective in making sure that you keep um, time sort of for research and development um, sacred? You got a good answer for that one, Toby? Um, well, I, I keep thinking about Tom Campbell, uh, who we met in New York, uh, director of the Met, and he said, make sure you travel once a month. You get more than 150 miles away from where you are. It changes your perspective, it gets you out, you meet colleagues in different situations. Um, and so I guess I, I'm a big believer in the, the behaviorist kind of approach. It's just structuring this, um, this thing, if you can do it. Um, so that, that kind of um, works for me. That, I, I tend not to get great ideas or to be able to figure things out at my desk. I'm too preoccupied with the day-to-day, um, -day, the emails, and then you know I have a glass wall. I'm kind of in a fishbowl office, so so um, you don't have a lot of privacy to really. Uh, you can't you can't hide and hide out and and, and work on things. So um, that's my my best advice for keeping the creative juices flowing and keeping the R&D going. Um, you know, uh, carving out work hours, I do that on my calendar. Uh, try to turn off email alerts, anything to try to get as much time you can in a flow experience so that something should, t should take you half an hour, only takes half an hour. Um, you know, basic, basic stuff there. But those things are so important. I, I like you also have, we have these beautiful offices, but they have one glass wall. And I've actually taken to putting post-its on my door that says, like, I know you can see me, but I'm actually working because people wave at me through the glass and things like that. But it's true. I find it almost impossible to work at the office. I actually have worked out that I work from home uh, one day a week. Um, not every week, but when possible. And that, for me, provides a huge buffer. Um, you know, and that way I sign into my email, I let them know I will be checking email at this time, this time, and this time, and I will not be checking email in between. So I get at least a couple hours to myself. Um, the traveling is big. I would actually say that one thing that's been a saver, and I'm not always so good at it because it takes a lot of pr preparation, but is to delegate things that maybe I am dreading, but would be an opportunity for someone to, to build a skill or to do something they didn't and to try and say, like, what can I actually pass off that I don't, I can't handle? Um, and it, sometimes it's risky, and it doesn't mean it's 100% successful that you may have to do some fixing things, but that's also good. I would say the other thing that I do regularly is um, uh, I have a subscription to the Harvard Business Review, and there's a section in there called Managing Yourself, which I actually find very useful, and I like the... Um, the Sunday New York Times, there's in the business section, there's a feature called the corner office um, that I also like. And um, I love reading the huge variety of management and self-management styles. Um, uh, I guess the last thing I would say is, and again, I, I give advice better than I take it, um, is that sort of whole airplane, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the safety thing that you have to put your oxygen mask on yourself before mm -hmm. you help somebody else. And I find when I am being uh, grumpy and short with people about things that usually that means I need a little, I need to put my oxygen mask back on. Um, and, and, and so it's, 
to be a little selfish sometimes and make sure I'm getting what I need so that I can help others. That, that you can't go on a, you can't leave town and go on a trip, go to a lecture, go to a noontime talk. It's a great kind of psychic hygiene. You won't be checking your email, you'll be listening to a creative person, and if you don't listen to them, maybe you'll get some ideas of your own. So I, um, I've really reminded of, of that. I know it's not easy to do all the time, but if you can do that uh, from time to time, you start to connect the dots. Finding those spaces where things start to come together is, is really important. So I will say um, encourage again those of you who are watching the webinar live, if you have questions to please go ahead and submit them. We have um, a bit of time left and we'd be happy to address them. But I'm wondering, um, Corey or Toby, if you have questions about any of the ups, downs, crosses, um, or self-management, um, questions that you have that um, you'd like to bring up. Well, I guess I was interested, Toby, in how you know you did did the freeze project and how you were managed able to actually manage the pull of you know your own job, your regular job, and then this enormous project on top of that. That's sort of extraordinary. Yeah, that was very lucky. Um, I'm an advisor to a section of the Freeze Masters Art Fair called Spotlight, and it's to sh it's to uh, be at this time there's 21 single artist presentations by um, galleries from around the world and they were focusing on our 20th century artists who had their first show before 1975 and um, I uh, you know it was it was a lot of extra work the first time was this was my first go around with this and so it was tricky managing this I was very lucky because the freeze team was very supportive and helped me a lot, and um, you know, my uh, I spent a lot of evenings and weekends doing this. Uh, it helped that I had a um, a slightly smaller workload here. I just finished a major exhibition that was kind of in the bag in a major catalog, and um, we had an interim administration, and that director is very supportive of this, and. Um, uh, yeah, so that that was it was nose to the grindstone stuff. It took a lot of organization, and um, I had to be very clear to my employers that I was making an absolute firewall between Manila time and um, spotlight time. Um, and uh, you know, it wasn't easy, and it took it did take a, a lot of extra time. I do think though the benefits of this and and the people. And artists that I've met have been uh, extraordinary, and, and and you know being very aware of conflicts of interest. But the the, the great information that's accrued to me and, and or come to me, and by extension, the Manil has been been wonderful. And it's the next go round uh, will be much easier. So, um, and you know. Anytime you know this, anytime you sit down to write an essay or an article, you're synthesizing all those things you're learning, and in a way, you're kind of putting a stake in the ground, saying, "Okay, here's who I am. Here are my capabilities, and here's who I am." And it's it's not always easy, and the late nights are hard and can be really tiring. But the you know, in the right spirit, in the right time, this is one of these moments to take stock and get in that state. You all know this where you're you're doing something and you think, wow, where'd that come from? I know, you know, it's some uh, leaps forward always happen these ways. Okay. Um, I'm wondering, Corey, you brought up um, early on another sort of outside of your curatorial scope, but um, your role as a manager of, of children <laughs> um, and um, so for a moment going back to, um, to sort of managing yourself um, and thinking about all you know, we've been discussing today the many um, sort of relationships um, that we manage across the arc of any given day and then I'm wondering you know, Chubby you've been talking a little bit about sort of extracurricular activities and how that, um, that benefits actually I think 
if I'm understanding correctly, um, while it sort of in some ways took you away from Manila, it actually informs and will um, make your work at the Manila better. Um, I'm wondering about other relationships outside of work um, that we manage because you know we have to make sure they're okay when we come into work or if we need to carve out time um, in the evenings. Um, I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about um, relationships outside of work and how that um, influences your management um, on the job. Well, for me, it's, it's yeah. For me, it absolutely does. I have two kids; they're five and nine. So um, you know that is uh, my. I mean, my, my days are a circus. <laughs> I mean, I wish I could say I did it with grace, but it is not graceful. Um, and you have to have a really good sense of humor. Um, and if you're very lucky, paid help at home because otherwise, I mean, I think that my nanny should get a, a acknowledgement, probably a paycheck from the museum, actually. Um, you know, I used to feel much worse about the things I have to say no to all the time. And that, for me, I think has been the hardest part. You know, that the things that I would really like to go to or do have to become luxuries. And um, I have to say no to a lot of things that I would really rather say yes to. But I've said yes to something else in my life, and um, I don't regret that. Um, but it's, it's rough. But it does mean that, you know, when I'm at the office, like, I don't spend, I, I don't take lunch most days. I work straight through because my day needs to be um, pretty rigorous and I don't spend too much time messing around on, you know, just wasting time. Um, and it means that I have to say no to things that aren't, you know, I have to decide my mission and things are either mission critical or they're not mission critical um, and I have to shed them if they're not mission critical. Um, I, it, you know, this will change eventually, I guess, but it's um, it's very difficult. I also recommend under eye concealer, um, <laughs> and that helps a lot. But it's true. I mean, Toby. I mean, even people who don't have kids, I think you find you do your writing at these ungodly hours of the night, um, which for me is not really my best thinking time. Um, but uh, it's often when it gets done. We're trying a little bit in the department to be more generous to one another and to say, like, hey, I have a catalog essay due. Can you take my meetings for the next week? Um, and so we're trying to see, I mean, where we can collaborate in ways to help each other out a little bit. Thank you. Um, yeah, as a, as a working mother, too, with a um, rambunctious family at home, um, I think that it has, um, sense of humor is critical, and it has helped me with my time management. Um, and you know, I've also gotten better at saying no to things, and I'm coming in and sort of focusing um, while I'm here. Uh, and I remember making the step up from um, you know, a curator to one who is going to be managing others, and facing that step up with some trepidation, and my husband said to me, well, you already manage you know, two difficult people, so if, you know, you'll, you'll be fine and, and sort of let you go. Um, and I think you know, learning as we go is something that we as managers are all doing. We talked um, at the very beginning about you know, we learned from the brave souls who went before us as managers, um, and I'm sure we are showing our reports what to do, and in some cases what they would say not to do. Um, but again, it's um, it's been wonderful, you know, hearing thoughts from the two of you about um, the varied roles that we play and how to um, really work across um, many different um, spectrums and facets of the museum. Um, so I would like to close by thanking you both for um, joining in this webinar, and I wonder if you have any last um, words of advice or thoughts you would want to share in closing. <laughs> this out, please let us know. Um, I'd love that. I'd be grateful. 
Yeah, I, I think this is the kind of thing, I mean, I feel a little bit like an imposter standing up here giving anybody advice about anything when you sort of feel like, I, I, I feel like I fail in all directions on a regular basis, but that that's sort of part of the job and to be okay with failing. Um, <laughs> I'm getting much more comfortable with it, so um, I think that has to be okay. And well, failing is one way to look at it, but also sort of learning and getting better next time is is, is perhaps um, another way to to translate it. So um, I think with with that, our time is up. But um, I will look forward to hopefully future webinars about um, about managing. And again, Toby and Corey, many thanks for your participation today. Thanks. Thank you.